Hey guys, it's me, Carrie, again. So in my last video on this channel, I talked about how I felt like I was being ignored or not taken seriously by the kids in the BFDI fandom, which is a minor problem. While yes, it is a problem, it just feels really minuscule compared to a lot of the other issues that have been making me feel down over the last few months. But first, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who left a positive comment on the last video. You guys were way more supportive and compassionate than I was expecting. I guess I feel that way because over the past few months, I've been spending so much time in online spaces where people really weren't there to listen or lend an ear that I sort of forgot how good it can really feel when people are listening to you and are kind of treating you like a human, especially this comment by Megan Doyle. I really appreciate it, and even though I didn't respond to almost any comments, I read almost all of them, so if you viewer left a comment, I probably saw it and thank you. But anyway, I guess it's time to move on to what this video is about, and I didn't want this channel Lazy K to just be a place for Carrie to rant and whine and whatever, but that's what it's looking like it's becoming, and it's a lazy, safe space, so whatever, I'm gonna do it anyway. So I've been on YouTube for almost 13 years now, and I guess as the years have gone by, my relationship with the internet has sort of felt like it's gone from something that I'm just excited and passionate about, to a love-hate relationship, to more of the hate side of things. Or not hate, but just a lot of negative emotions that are almost, like, overwhelming and unbearable. And I want to preface this all by saying that the rational side of my brain recognizes that the world doesn't owe me anything, and just because I get some level of achievement and accomplishment in one area doesn't mean that I am owed or deserve achievements in an another, and the world is just not technically a fair place, so I recognize that. But the mental behaviors I've been noticing in myself in the past four years, and especially the past year, have just been getting more and more unproductive and negative spiral-like. What's happening is, I feel like my brain is subconsciously keeping track of a list of injustices I feel like have been played against me, where I felt like I was given the short end of the stick or deserved better, and I keep thinking to myself, oh eventually I'll make a giant video or a giant expose where I lay down all the facts, expose what was wrong that was done to me, and get everyone on my side and get the people in power to fix it. And I don't think that's healthy. While it is a good practice to speak on something especially egregious that's happening to you, because then people in power can be alerted of it and try to stop it and you might get justice for yourself. I think for me, the list is so long and convoluted and tainted by my own confirmation bias that it's not born out of a rational place anymore. And since I'm never going to make that expose, big explanation, justice for Carrie video, probably I'm probably never going to make it because it just feels like too much work. Thinking about this stuff is just making me wallow in this place of resentment of the online world. And I need to stop it as soon as possible. Diving into the specifics, here's a chart. I've concluded that a significant portion of these injustices stem from the fact that I'm seen as a brand slash utility more often than I'm seen as a human. I also don't really like using the word injustice. It just sounds really harsh and extreme and legal, but I couldn't really find a softer word or synonym to use instead. Now I know this is kind of weird, but I've split this category into five subcategories, the first one being called, I don't know your face or your IRL experience. I also don't want to dive too into detail into any of these sub bubbles because if you let me, I'll talk about these subjects for hours and hours and not make any productive progress. But I'll give like maybe one or two concrete examples of each bubble just to help paint the picture and help you understand. So the first bubble is I don't know your face, and the gist of it is that most of the content I make online doesn't show my face or my personality or my style or just the vibe I give off as a human being. The most clear example of this is the scale of the universe. So the scale of the universe is this online educational tool I made in 2010 and 2012, so this is like high school, and it went super viral and it ended up in a bunch of museums and websites, and I'm really grateful for that whole experience experience and being able to talk to a bunch of scientists in that way, but again, that was like eight years ago. And yes, I do admit that the scale of the universe kinda got stolen and shared to a bunch of other websites, and so you might think, oh, this is just an instance of Kerry being concerned that his content was stolen unfairly and he wasn't given credit. While that is true, I think that is not the majority of the picture here. Because here's the thing, on the scale of the universe, on the credits line, it has my name, Kerry Huang, so you can technically say, well even if it gets stolen, your credit is there in the first place. But it's like, when someone views an educational tool, like the scale of the universe, they're not looking to read the text at the very
very bottom of the screen and remember it verbatim. And so 10 years later, every time I mention, oh, I created the scale of the universe on any of my YouTube videos or like in real life or anything, there's always like so many people in the comments who say, what? My science teacher used to show this in school, but I had no idea you were the guy who made it, which on the surface is very flattering because it's cool to think that there's all these different experiences that people had with so too that I wasn't even aware of. And it, so I guess its influence has spread a lot further than I had thought. And that should make me feel really good. But after this has sort of happened thousands of times, it feels like, it has sort of left me with this impression that if I don't announce that I was the creator of the scale of the universe, then all these people who did say, what, I had no idea it was you, would just be left with the impression that it was made by some faceless corporation or educational institution and no human was behind it. And even though my name was written in text at the bottom, they would have never known it was me. And I guess it does seem a little egotistical or self-centered to say that it even matters. Like if my sole goal was just to educate as much of the public as possible, then my personal brand or whatever shouldn't be tied to it at all. Like I should just be happy that, you know, 170 million people saw the tool. But I feel like even while I'm trying to be as selfless as possible, the fact that my content and me as a human have become so separated has led to a lot of situations that have just made me feel very very frustrated. One example of this is the time I went to this convention for educational content creators. Now most educational YouTubers show their face all the time in their videos, which makes sense because they are the teacher who's guiding the students along, so it's actually helpful for the students to see a relatable human face who can be down to earth and explain things in the same way that they would understand them. YouTubers like Vsauce, Veritasium, Mark Rober, Smarter Every Day, Tom Scott, and more. And I want to say I'm huge fans of all these YouTubers because because education in general is great and important. But it's like I went to this convention because I wanted to get to meet them, but I realized that since nobody knows my face, I would have to explain what I made as my sort of reason to say hi, because I didn't want to seem like a random kiddo who felt like they were entitled to a conversation when they hadn't contributed anything. And I felt like if I made Scale of the Universe, which I'm pretty sure some of them had seen, then they might want to strike up a conversation with me. But what actually happened was, you know, I'm in line to talk to this other YouTuber and I whip out my phone to pull up scale of the universe. And you can already tell that this isn't the way that humans naturally talk to each other. So the other YouTubers start saying, oh no, we got another self-promoter here. We don't have time for this. We got to get to the panel. We got to get to the Q&A. Talk to you later. And I mean, I shouldn't blame them because they didn't know who I was and they were all invited to this convention. So they had busy schedules, whereas I was a nobody who had paid to be there. And so I didn't really have a busy schedule. But I know this might make me sound sensitive, but that whole experience, that interaction kind of seared into my memory of this feeling of othering and you know being kicked out of the cool kids club because I wasn't the type of person to always use their face in their videos and you know I see other educational youtubers start making videos and they're sort of absorbed into a community where they become close friends with everyone else within months I've been on here doing educational content since 2010 and like I don't know if this you know super viral tool wasn't enough to get people to want to know me then like nothing will be. But moving on from that experience, there's also that situation where the scale of the universe got our AdSense account banned for two and a half years and we lost out on about half a million to one million dollars. And I hate bringing that up again and I hate how much I talk about it, but that whole experience has had such effect on molding and manipulating my own perception of myself and my perception of my place on the internet that I just can't stop thinking about it like a nightmare. And the reason why I feel like that fits into this pattern of being seen as a brand and utility without a face is that other YouTubers who have a really likable personality, it, it feels like they have this avenue that they can talk to YouTube representatives or YouTube friends that they know in real life. And as soon as their AdSense account gets banned within like a week or two, or at most a month, they have ways of resolving it. But because Michael and I were sort of faceless entities, we did try sending multiple appeals to Google, but Google just saw us as this sort of faceless entity and they didn't respond for over two years. And I think that it was partly my fault for not trying to be more vocal and explain more how this affected us as two innocent teenagers in high school. But like the pattern just continues that, you know, if I was just a typical YouTuber who just vlogged about their personal life, the fact that the audience and the outside world could relate to me as a human would mean that someone would feel compassionate to step in and help me if they had that power. But I never did that. So there was no compassion to be had. And I could go on and on. I could also 
also talk about how I feel like our apps on the app store get downvoted to hell because, you know, we charge a dollar, but no one really knows that like, oh, a human actually spent like three months of work on it. But I think that I don't want this video to end up being an hour long, so I guess I'll just move on. I labeled the second bubble number comparison game, and here's how that story starts. I, as a person, have always been interested in data sets, data visualization, and statistics in general. So from the very start on YouTube, maybe 2010 or 2011, I was fascinated with looking at the statistics of YouTube channels. I noticed that other YouTube channels typically got about one subscriber for every 100 views. But for our channels, we were getting about one subscriber for every 1,000 views. So in other words, for the same impact on the audience, we were getting about 10% the returns that other YouTubers were getting. And in the years since then, I've concluded that that's because our audience is so much younger than the average YouTube audience, so a bunch of kids don't even know that the subscribe feature exists. Two, a lot of people like watching BFDI episodes over and over, so it's not actually new people coming to watch. And three, again, our animation content looks kind of like something that comes out of a faceless corporation, and nobody would want to subscribe to a corporation like McDonald's or something, but you would want to subscribe to your favorite charismatic vlogger. So all three of those factors combined led to this ratio that's like 10 times lower than average. And over the years, I've come to accept this and sort of wear it as a badge of honor, just the fact that our view counts are so high, but our subscriber count, relatively speaking, is so low. But I feel like in the years since then, this number comparison game has transformed, metamorphized, and become a perverted version of itself, where every social media platform is a place for me to compare numbers, ratios, conversion levels, and if the ratios are egregious enough, it's like another piece of evidence that I store within this tree of injustices against me, which is dumb. Like there's one instance where I look at like, oh, Twitter followers per YouTube view, and my ratios are literally like 500 times lower than other people. And I know that this is just evidence that I'm really bad at getting people to switch platforms and follow me elsewhere, which is a me problem, not a you problem. But it's like I can't enjoy content on YouTube that much without subconsciously looking at the view count and seeing, wow, per view, this video is getting 10 times more likes than my videos would get if they got the same number of views. And, you know, I, I do enjoy a lot of YouTubers content genuinely, but I kind of wish I could just turn all those statistics off temporarily so I could just enjoy it in silence for a bit before the clamor of my brain's number comparison gears start churning up again, you know? And I think this all reminds me of that instance with that Instagrammer who has like 2.7 million followers but could only sell 12 t-shirts. It kind of gives all the same vibe. And I try to think to myself, well, I'm different because I actually still get lots of views. It's just, and like, there are lots of kids who are enthusiastic but they just don't know how to go to other places. But I think that's, again, a sort of perverted mind thought of a way of sort of covering my bases and excusing my bad mental behavior. So let's just move on from that. The third bubble is every success is to be ex expected, but every failure is a shocking scandal. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And a good example of that is when BFB, which is the fourth season of BFDI, split into two branches, which was back in March of this year. And we got so much backlash and hatred because people, you know, they just wanted the show to continue like normal. And it's sort of like, if you do your job wrong, people People will notice and you know yell at you for a lot a long time but if you do it right it will seem as if you have done nothing at all because what nobody really recognizes is that since the split there have been 10 episodes of BFB that they've gotten whereas otherwise they might have only gotten one or two episodes but yeah it always feels like there's this big controversy that breaks out every time an episode has a character show up in a place that they shouldn't have or this is like slight mistake and the backgrounds change when they shouldn't and no recognition for the fact that the episode came out at all. And I don't want to go down that whole rabbit hole and talk about how I feel like 10 mediocre episodes is always better than one perfect one. That's a mentality that's sort of a personal choice, so I, I can't really convince people one way or another. But you know with YouTubers who are more just personalities, it's like I remember Markiplier uploaded a few videos where he was in a hospital because of some accident, which is tragic, and you know, I'm glad he was able to heal completely from that. But if someone uploads themselves in a hospital, all the comments are super positive and it's like, get well soon, don't worry about uploading to YouTube, just focus on yourself for now, which is how it should be. But notice how nobody comments about how this video is statistically shorter or less good or lower quality than the previous video, which is sort of all the talk of what my channels are always about, how like if a video does better than the previous one, then there's no talk about it. But if it's, if it's worse, then controversy. And I just, I, I, I'm a person, I, I, I wish, I wish just 
making content was enough. Like it, one is better than zero. It's not as good as two. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, okay, the fourth bubble is called obligatory constant maintenance. And the example of this is that on my channel, Carrie KH, I have uploaded a lot of programming projects such as Elemental 3 or Game of Life and Death. And sometimes I turn them into web pages or mobile apps. But the thing is, I'm one person, I'm not a company. So often these projects get abandoned as I move on to other projects and I don't maintain them. And so sometimes they stop working. And what ends up happening is people who stumble upon these videos years later will notice that, you know, the web page doesn't load anymore. Or in the case of my iOS app, I said I had planned on porting it to Android, but three years later, I still haven't. And the comment section is just filled with people who are upset that I lied about that, that Android is not here. And people for form comment chains where they just comment how many days it's been since I said that I would have made Android and didn't. And it's gotten to the point where mentally I have forced myself to not go and rewatch old programming project videos because I know that it's, I'm one scroll away from all this backlash that really ruins my mental health. So it's kind of a shame, but I tell myself, never look at Evolvio videos, never look at Elemental 3 videos, never look at the GoLad subreddit. Do not look because you will feel bad. And I just wish that making game development like that was more similar to video genres like comedy skits, beauty gurus, or vlogging. Because with those genres. Every time a content creator uploads a video, the audience either likes it or doesn't like it, but they move on. And it's like, they can just be happy that the video existed for the day or two that it, you know, it was the most recent video. Whereas with a lot of the game development videos I've made, there's this expectation that every new video is maintained or every project is maintained ad infinitum. And so if I make 10 videos, the amount of work grows quadratically instead of linearly. And it kind of feels like, oh, I hate to relate this to Greek mythology, but it's like every time I make a video about a project, I gain a new fury. Like, I don't know if you know the story about Agamemnon, Clytemnestra, and Orestes, but it's like these furies chase Orestes until he kills his own mother. And um, I know this is a lot less severe than that, but like these furies will chase me everywhere. Um, and like every time I like pop my head on any other corners of the internet, whether that's on like Reddit or Twitter or YouTube or Facebook, it's like a completely un related request or demand for like, you really have left the Twelve community behind, haven't you? What a disappointment. You're a traitor. Like I, I know people online will be mean and I should just ignore it, but it's like, they're everywhere. I cannot escape them because I guess there's just so many projects I've done. Like the, the, just the sheer number of them has meant that statistically I can't really hide, but it has just made me wonder, will I ever get relief from this? Because if the demands don't die down, after four years, six years, nine years, it never will. And I just have to learn how to cope with that. And I guess some personalities are better at it than me. Um, I, I feel in certain ways that I have gotten more sensitive in the last few years after leaving college than when I was in high school or something. And I try to figure out why that is also. I think it has part in part to do with the fact that when I was in school, I could treat the internet as sort of half of my lifestyle. And whenever I got sick of it, I would say, well, I'm also half a high school student so let me just focus on my high school life instead whereas now that I'm out of school this is my life this is 100% of what I have to care about and so when someone makes my online life less pleasant I don't really have a place to turn to and say like oh I can focus on this as my livelihood instead and maybe I should like I, that's why I feel like a traditional job could be so much more appealing than this um but yeah I think the year of 2020 has just been the year where I have learned what websites and what places not to go. So I've unfollowed everyone who's related to BFDI. As much as I appreciate people who are fans and posting fan art, I just cannot stand all the controversies. Okay, let's just finish this. The fifth bubble, I wrote talking about him rather than with him. And him is me. So maybe I should have made that clear. But it's just this shift I have noticed on my channel, Humany, where in the past, when I first started it, I would make a video about a random topic and then people in the comments would discuss 
discuss it with me and you know how silly it was or how interesting it was they would say well Carrie I think this okay that's quite simplified but that's the idea whereas now if I post a human video people in the comments will be talking with each other about me like they'll refer to me in the third person where they'll say like well look at he posted a video of leafy in the microwave or something and it's not everyone I do admit that there's still a good portion who talk to me as a human but the proportion of people who see my content as sort of so corporate and brand like that I'm not really a person there and like it's more a platform for them to find other people who are like more like them to talk to instead of me it's rising and it's rising fast and I think that that's why I really appreciated what you guys had to say on this channel because you guys were talking to me and with me again which hasn't happened on that channel for a while I feel like or it probably has and I do want to say thank you to everyone who, who does comment on humany in that way but they're the minority now. So those are all the five branches of problems that have arisen from people seeing me as a brand rather than a human. And I want to say that I realize that these problems are privileges to bear and I don't want to come across as spoiled or ungrateful. I also realize that the vast majority of people following me are silent yet supportive and it's only this vocal minority of people who like getting upset and shouting the loudest that I'm hearing the most. So I just need to learn to tune them out. Um, one of the reasons why I didn't make this video more high quality or I guess m put more structure into it is because I don't really think there's much that can be achieved with this. I've thought about this several times where if I'm going through an emotional rough patch, often talking about it publicly online doesn't really resolve anything. It just makes it worse. And what I notice with myself lately is that I go through waves of really high highs and low lows. And, you know, when I'm in one of the lows, it feels like I need to talk about how I'm feeling because there's just so much pent up emotion I need to get out. But then as soon as I start to get out of that slump, I wonder what I was even complaining about. And then if I look back at my history and realize that I made it public that I felt upset, I just feel like, Carrie, you're such a fool. You know, now you feel fine. You didn't need to make this publicly known. Um, and it feels like the cyclical cycle of going up and down, okay, that was repetitive, whatever, is kind of regular. And by that, I mean, if I'm feeling really frustrated and negative, even though it's really hard to see past that, logically and rationally, I know that within three hours or six hours, things will start to feel better. Like maybe if I go out on a jog or I go eat a meal, they will get better through means other than trying to fix the problem head on. They will get better regardless of if I rant about it online. But the same is true when I'm in the highs. I know that within the next 24 hours, I will start to crash and burn again. And so I have to sort of take advantage of every high while it lasts because that that's when I can make videos and stuff like that. But I have thought, you know, even if I did make a giant video trying to lay down all the evidence and sort of make my case, what is the internet supposed to do with that? It's like, this isn't a legal system. There's no jury. There's no judge. There's no court system. Or, and there's no jail. And the most that the internet can really do is show compassion, which some of you have, and, and that's been super helpful. And, and it's hard to overstate that it really helps. I, it, it helps a lot for me emotionally but like on terms of a structural change nothing's gonna happen like I have sort of fantasies where if I make it sound bad enough it will go viral and eventually I'll start to get all the support and you know big YouTube friends and all the haters will go away that I want but that's not gonna happen so um it feels like every day there are at least a couple bouts of frustration so deep that I like I just have to make a video talking about it but I suppress and I'm glad I suppress but this can't continue like I want to end up living a lifestyle where most of the hours I know that no no life is perfect and to hope for like eternal happiness is just a pipe dream but at least a lifestyle where there aren't 50% of my hours where I'm battling against the other 50% where like during the happy hours I'm telling my, my future self do not vent your emotions just wait and the other 50% I'm like so frustrated and I want to make a video exposing so badly that I'm like happy Carrie you didn't know what how bad it gets and and it, it's like a, a struggle with myself a struggle with the internet and I just wish there was a little more stability in the way that I interacted um I don't really know if there's any sort of video series I feel super passionate about I feel like most of them are obligations at this point yeah I don't know what else there is to say I guess I'll just end the video here thanks for listening everyone I'm willing to bet that 10 minutes after I upload this video I want to delete it because of everything I said earlier um, 
I really don't know what to accomplish here. Oh, I, uh, some other things I wanted to say. I am seeing a therapist um, because I realized that actual professional assistance is better than a bunch of online anonymous people. And last summer, I, I don't talk about this much, but last summer, meaning summer of 2019, I did have some pretty bad mental health problems and I saw quite a few therapists. I think I saw four of them and I also was on medication, but I don't want to sort of give off that image to all the little kids who follow me. So if, yeah, let's just not, let's just pretend I didn't say that, but I think um, you don't have to worry about me as much as it sounds like I'm saying, because I guess I do have other avenues for getting help. Um, but yeah, it's just the, the bouts of like high highs and low lows that needs to stop or it doesn't need to, but I just wish it would stop. Off. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. I'll see you later. Bye.